see, seeing the stress that it puts on on everyone around you and and not really fully understand obviously i have no concept of what geopolitical war and and intention means as a as a like 8 year old but i do understand what it means to see my mom cry and having to pass through through checkpoints was something that i that i always thought was like just a part of life um there was still checkpoints up to up to like the early 2000s in the south and um you feel you feel the energy completely shift when when we come up to these things you feel the fear in people that you look to for comfort and security and reassurance and to look to someone like like a family member for that and not see it because they're scared at such at such a at such a young age will leave an impression on you and even though i had no idea why things were happening i knew that that things were happening and they were negatively affecting us Sarah, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for coming on The Empire Files. I have to say that I was very thrilled that uh, you responded to me and that you wanted to come on. Are you kidding? You're literally an idol of mine. I am so honored to be speaking with you. I, I, I'm i very much looking forward to this. You, I have so much respect and admiration for you. And, and I'm very grateful that someone like you exists and has put out the things you, you've put out and committed so much of their life into researching and and shedding light on things that really get brushed under the table in the West. So no, you're a legend and an icon. <laughs> Thank you. That That is extremely sweet. I have to say that the more I learn about you, I love you even more than I did by just following your social media. I mean, you're, you're an amazing woman and I'm super stoked to have you on and I've been looking forward to this. So this is, this is great. Um, I love how outspoken you are on Palestine, especially. I mean, duh, you're Lebanese. Obviously, you're going to like have a strong opinion about what Israel is doing. But I love that you will not back down because there is so much media backlash every time. It's like the New York Post writes an article about every tweet that you make. I mean, that's how much in the spotlight your your opinions are. And it's, and it's nuts just how much people really, really are incited by by what you say about this. And it's super important. I mean, when you look at what you are actually saying, this is the most amazing thing about it, because the headlines are all just like running with, oh, uh, you know, Mia Khalifa says this and that. And then when you actually like dig into the article and see what is it that you're saying that's so controversial, it's actually completely not controversial, complete factual statements like, I want to go back to this post during the Sheikh Jarrah ethnic cleansing in 2021, because I think that this really just symbolizes how deranged um, the the press can be when it's trying to demonize someone. You simply posted a photo of you drinking a bottle of wine, like an old bottle of wine from France. Looked good. It looked awesome. It was a great photo. And you just were like, My, this wine is older than your apartheid state. And holy shit, did minds explode where you actually had Avi Mayer, who is essentially like a spokesperson for the IDF. He's the editor in chief of the Jerusalem Post. And he is, he's a pretty, you know, he's a pretty high profile Israeli. He actually said, I have to quote this because it's so outrageous. He said, you were showcasing champagne produced in Nazi occupied France. Like who in the fuck would look at that photo and, and say that when they're just looking at an old bottle of French wine. I mean, just completely creating anti-Semitism where there is none. <laughs> Especially when that statement is literally counterproductive to what he's trying to say because it was Nazi-occupied France. They were occupied. <laughs> they weren't producing it. Like, it re- it's, it's, it's truly... You go crazy. Like, you really feel like you're being gaslit by people who are supposedly respectful and intelligent and all of these things that are attributed to being in these high high level powerful positions in government and in and in media like it's it makes it makes you feel like you're you're going like w- listen to what you just said back say it again say it slower maybe say it backwards and do you still stand by it Is- I definitely still stand by by what I said 
It's nuts. It's so nuts. I can't imagine being in the spotlight like you are and just having just completely innocuous things be twisted into some perverted like display of anti-Semitism. I mean, poor Greta Thunberg. I don't know if you saw that where she just simply posted a photo of her and her friends with signs saying, you know, we stand with Gaza and calling for a ceasefire. And there was like a little toy octopus in the background. And it became, it just spiraled out into like, the octopus is an anti-Semitic trope. And, and oh, what is Greta Thunberg trying to say about this? It's like, I'm pretty sure that that was just a completely harmless, like toy stuffed animal in the background of this photo. But it's just like, it's mind blowing because it's, it's so desperate. It's so desperate to twist the narrative and to deflect from what they're actually doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, you hear it simply in the way they speak, like when Netanyahu is doing interviews in the West, like with CNN or something, the, the way that they try and drive in the propaganda into everything they say, like not, Hamas doesn't leave their mouth without who are, and they are just like ISIS immediately following it. Like it's, it's, it's insane. It's insane that they're number one, given a platform like a news organization like CNN, but number two, that, that they assume that the general public is, isn't immune to the propaganda. Like we've seen it with, with Trump. We know what it's like to, to generate hysteria over things that are completely factless, completely untrue, based on just lies, just hoping that it sticks into, into a couple minds, because once it sticks to it into a couple minds, it's going to spread in those communities. And that's all that they can hope for. But, um, I, I can't remember who it was. Um, but I, I heard a, tra- um, I, I saw a transcript of some leaked audio of, of someone saying that it's not a left and someone, someone on mm. the Israeli side saying it's not a left and right divide. It's a young and old, the younger generation is, is catching on to everything and we need to do everything we can to stop that. And TikTok was mentioned in all of these platforms that are used to, to spread awareness and, and, and shine light on all of this. Um, they're terrified of these things. It was Jonathan Greenblatt of the Anti-Defamation League. And it was a leaked audio recording where he actually said, quote, we have a major generational problem. All of the polling I've seen suggests it's not a left-right gap. The issue is young and old. And I think that really, it strikes to the heart of the problem because Israel's losing hold of the narrative that they've been, maintain- I mean, they've maintained the narrative for so long because of the collusion with the press. I mean, they're a junior collaborator of the U.S. empire. They they work in concert with the U.S. corporate media. I mean, so the, the U.S. corporate media, like all um, allies of the U.S. empire, they just basically run um, press releases from the IDF and they're just their media stenographers. And so for the longest time, up until the advent of social media, Israel's just been able to have this stronghold on like what the talking points are. But as you've seen Palestinians dictate their own reality, that's slipping away more and more. And they are so desperate. I mean, we know that they have war rooms at Tel Aviv University with dozens, probably hundreds, if not thousands of people who are literally employed to correct the record online, whether it's Wikipedia or whatever. We know that Israeli officials try to take down pro-Palestine posts on TikTok and, and Twitter, but it still isn't working, Sarah. I mean, because Palestinians are, are, are showing us real time, like these are the atrocities. This is our life. You can't argue with that. Like, but of course they try, right? They're even grotesquely insinuating that these people are all like, like working as actors and, and all the bait, like the dead babies are like toys. And I mean, it's fucking sick. It's, it's, it's truly dystopian. It makes you, it makes you feel like, are are we living in the same world? Like how, (laughs) how can someone like stand and say these things and perpetuate these things when we're seeing it with our own eyes. We're seeing the reality that is in Gaza and we're seeing the reality that is in in Tel Aviv and the rest of Israel. When it's not just Gaza that isn't safe. We haven't even touched on the West Bank and Israeli citizens who were who are of Palestinian descent being arrested in their homes simply for for standing in solidarity with children who are being murdered in their own homes. It's it's lunatic. It's twisted beyond belief. And, and I think that really strikes to the heart of why you are such a threat, because we're talking about like, especially like Gen Z, you know, millennials, Gen Z, people know what the hell's going on. You look at even like polling for just support for Israel. It's it's exactly the same thing. And I don't think it it's necessarily just distrust in corporate media, um, although I do think that that has a huge 
role to play. I think that, you know, people who grew up, especially in a post 9-11 world, it's like, that. that's just like the meme. It's like the media lies us into war over and over again. So why would you believe them now? But I think more importantly is that Israel's control over the narrative for so long. I mean, this goes back to the clash of civilizations. It goes back to just that, that idea that Arabs are terrorists. And it, of course, was cemented further with with 9-11, but it's always been a racist, dehumanizing trope that Israeli colonialism and U.S. imperialism has relied on to advance their goals in the Middle East. And this caricature is super successful, but it's waning, I think, in large part because Americans are, like, meeting Arabs more. Like, we're getting out of our comfort zone. There's a lot of, you know, diaspora of a lot of, like, refugees around the world. Like, a lot of people, their neighbors, their friends, their coworkers, like, they're meeting people and they're like, oh— this isn't what I've been told by the media forever. And, and of course, social media. Like, kids who are following you, all of these kids who are following, like, iconic, powerful, influential, popular Arab people, whether it's musicians or artists or just, like, fashion icons, I mean, that's dispelling the myth real time as well. And you can't propagandize to people who are, like, young because they're seeing it for themselves and they're just following these people themselves instead of like what old people are telling them who to hate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The younger generation is not susceptible to it. They're and and they're offended that that they think that they're that they'll fall for it. They're really offended by not valuing their intelligence and thinking that that they would just simply believe them when they when they can see for themselves and they can read for read about it for themselves and um I think that there was there's been a little bit of a bell curve post 9-11. I, Arabs, every, everyone was a terrorist. And the more that, that a lot of us have been put in the mainstream, like, um, like Rami Youssef and, and Rima Faki winning Miss USA in 2011, like all of these, all of these people representing us and, and, and showing the world who, who we are and who we can be that kind of shifted. And now it's, I feel like, I feel like we're back in the post 9-11 world or they're trying to get us back there. And it's not going to work because the younger generation has already seen these people, the people who are, who are smart and who are speaking up and who are speaking up about it and who are, who are representing the right side of history. That's who they look up to. And that's who, that's who they're going to listen to. And also I think, um, seeing the difference in the people who are, who are showing up at the protests or, or showing up at, at in, in any place that, that, that are being occupied. Um, they're seeing that it's young, diverse, culturally, racially, religiously diverse groups of people versus old white people who are showing up for Zionism and defending a Holocaust and, and, calling for a non ceasefire which is the most insane thing in the entire world i don't care i don't care who is fighting if you're against a ceasefire like what what <laughs> i mean it's racism and and i think that we should be really clear about that because israel again has depended on like folding in progressivism to their identity that's why they have this whole fake veil of being lgbtq friendly and, you know, they have gay pride. Mar I mean, it, gay marriage isn't even legal in Israel. And also it's so targeted to try to fold in liberalism and just well-intentioned liberals who aren't, don't consider themselves racist. But that's falling apart, too, because the more Israeli society is revealed, like you can no longer just wash away what they're doing and be like, oh, it's just Netanyahu's government. No, no, it's not. The entire government is a fascistic force. The entire state of Israel is based on an ethno state and it's based on an artificial majority that is only that only exists because of the expulsion of indigenous inhabitants. And the quicker people realize that, the faster Israel is falling apart. And, um, you know, it's so crazy. I was in Jerusalem. Well, I was in the West Bank in 2016. It was amazing. I mean, Palestinians are the most beautiful, gracious people in the world. I went into Jerusalem for like 30 minutes. And then like, as I'm just talking to people on the streets, it was so disgusting, Sarah, because even though I know like peripherally that Israeli society is really racist, you, you simply don't expect to be hearkened back to like Jim Crow apartheid in America, like in the deep South. But to have that in front of your face on camera, Israelis speaking when they know that they're speaking into a camera, two of them were just like carpet bomb them all, kill them all. And it's like, 
Who are the racist people here? Because we hear constantly that Palestinians think this about Jewish people, but in reality, I mean, it's a huge majority of Israelis that are virulently racist. They want to either expel all Arabs from their land or they're okay with saying to carpet bomb them on camera. It's absolutely deplorable. It's really, it's really heartbreaking too, because I feel like I feel like Arabs are held to a completely different standard if if they if there was if there was even one interview out there of like like a, like a street interview asking asking arabs it, 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 them responding like that like how how would you like to free palestine oh we should carpet bomb israel mm-hmm. there i mean what what's happening right now would probably happen even though right now it's unprovoked and and solely because of of Palestinians trying to liberate themselves and fight for a chance for, for them to have humanity and and human rights like everyone else. Um, I think that I think that Arabs have to have to behave a lot more calmly and with grace and respond a lot more um, thoughtfully because they are held to a completely different standard. Um, is, is Zionists speak so? candidly in the most disgusting way about how they feel about Arabs and how they feel about Palestinians and, and what they think the solution is. And it's just, it's just brushed off. No one, no, no one raises an eyebrow. No one, no one cares that someone has said this. It would be headlines everywhere. If there was one interview of Palestinians saying this, it's, it's truly, it's truly gross. The double standard that exists in, in the media and in the public eye. Um, and I think that we're seeing that right now with people getting fired simply for saying ceasefire, whereas people can hold up Zionism as sexy signs and and call for for uh, hold up signs that say uh, Hamas are rapists, all Pen- Palestinian Palestinians are Hamas, all of these things that are just so racist, so abhorrent, so disgusting and and hateful. It's a completely different standard. And we saw this play out in the last month from, from, I mean, the United States is even talking about what we're doing on our phones and, and, and the things that we're interacting with to control the spread of hate speech and to control the spread of all of the, like, no one is talking about this when, when Zionists are calling for carpet bombing an entire civilization and an entire group of people. That's not that's not what they're talking about monitoring or or controlling. Yeah, and even though they're doing it, it's like crazy. I mean, it's all based on hypothetical ideas um, and tone policing pro Palestine demonstrators. It's not about anti semitism. It's not about no, anti semitism. And it's no. crazy that you see like the audacity of liberal politicians to go out there and pontificate about the credibility of Hamas run this and that and. Meanwhile, literally reprinting press releases from the most distrustful institution I've ever seen. I I have never seen a government. Yeah, our government's pretty fucked. and, And there's a lot of propaganda that's gotten us into war and manufactured consent for horrible atrocities. But the cartoonish nature of Israeli propaganda to be completely uncritically parroted across the board and by the president of the United States himself, the 40 beheaded babies, the mass rape, the fact that an errant missile blew up the hospital after Israel bombed the hospital and told them to get out because they're going to bomb it again. I mean, the Hamas command centers under every hospital. It's like, it is like watching a cartoon from the abyss of like an alternate dimension because it's like, how? They have zero credibility. At this point, we should look back and say, Every single thing that the Israeli military says should be taken with a very small grain of salt because everything that they've said has turned out to be a lie. So why in the hell would you just run (laughs) with anything that they say? And it's such a disgrace to see as this genocide unfolds, to see our president stand up there and say, we can't trust the death toll Sarah, we cannot trust the death toll in Gaza because Hamas run health ministry is run by Hamas. And it's like, I mean, it's it's nightmarish. It's like, I don't even have adjectives to describe this. It's, I, it's unprecedented to cage a population and then carpet bomb them and deprive them of food and water. Like you said, I mean, just imagine if it were white Jewish people in that situation, the world would be aghast. And we just sit back. I mean, the dehumanization and anti-Arab racism that allows this to happen 
is quite astounding. It's exactly, it's the anti-Arab racism. I mean, that's that's why they can get away with holding up a calendar and saying, this is the schedule for who gets, for who has to watch the hostages when it's just a calendar. They see little squiggles on a piece of paper going from left to right, and then immediately it's a terrorist manifesto. It's a, cal- it's a calendar. It reads the days of the week in Arabic. It's, it's, it's Oh my gosh. And, and all of the propaganda videos of, of Israeli actresses pretending to be Palestinian nurses in perfectly clean gear in terrible Arabic accents, absolutely awful Arabic accents that you can hear the, the, the Hebrew through. It's, it's really, really embarrassing for them. But at the same time, it's working on some people, not not the general public, but it's sticking with some people, and that's what they're hoping for. They're hoping for, they're hoping to catch the people who are not willing to do their own research or not willing to look past whatever headline they see first, whatever whatever the most salacious thing comes up first on their timeline that they run with as as fact and true, like the people who ran with the 40 beheaded babies and the mass rapes and and lighting people's homes on fire while they're still in them. The people who ran with that have no prior knowledge of anything that's happened in the last 75 years, which is why they think that it was in a completely unprovoked attack. It was not an unprovoked attack. It was it was the manifestation of 75 years of occupation, of, of 60, how, 16, 20 years of, of living in an open air prison. When was the wall built? Like 2003, 2004? Like uh, it was built for a reason and Israel left Gaza for a reason, but they have, they have trapped them in this open air prison for so like, what, what do you expect to happen? Do you expect people to just lay down and die? That's what they're hoping for right now. They're hoping people will just lay down and die and move into the Sinai and and emigrate to, to all different parts of the world and be thankful that they still get to live. They do not understand that no one is willing to do that. These, these doctors are not willing to leave their hospitals. They're willing to die on the ground that they were born on. It's sick. And, and if I were Israeli, if I were Jewish, I would blame the root of of all of this, which is the occupation and the siege. And for people to say, oh, we gave them Gaza, like I heard Israelis tell me this back in 2016, we gave them Gaza. They should be happy that we gave them Gaza. And also Israel just pretends that Gaza is some autonomous region that has its own army and that it's like somehow a war between states. Doesn't anyone sit back and think, how is it that Israel can cut off electricity and and aid and fuel if they're not completely occupying Gaza from the outside. It's just so stupid and illogical. <laughs> exactly. And and that's another thing that that really bothers me about it being called a war. You're not you you, you don't control every single resource that goes in and out of a country you're waging a war on. It ha- also you have to wage a war on a country. They're not waging a war on a country. They're waging a war on an occupied group of people in the most densely packed area in the entire world and starving them to death and forcing dehydration on them and innocent children and innocent people. And and they're calling the people who are refusing to leave their houses, they're they're insinuating that that they're there to fight or or that they're there as a part of, of a terrorist organization when in reality, they are a prideful group of people who would rather die in their homes than die in a refugee camp that's even more that's even more dangerous and overpopulated and and crowded it's 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 really devastating the picture that's being painted of people who are who are staying behind and who are choosing not to leave um and and i i think that's one of the most heartbreaking things because i i see like i my heart breaks for them. They are, they are so brave. They have so much pride and they have so much connection to the place that they're, that they're willing to die on. They, they don't want to go to Egypt. Egypt doesn't even want them. Egypt is, Egypt is one of the most racist towards Palestinians, Middle Eastern country that exists. I would say, I would even say Lebanon is second. It's not, they don't want to go to Lebanon. They don't want to go to Egypt just to live. They want to live in Palestine where they're from. Yeah. Yeah. And and right now, now that they, you know, they carpet bombed the entire area, killed 4,000 children. Now this raid on Al-Shifa hospital where babies are being ripped out of incubators, 
Sarah, just like, you know, the lies that brought us into the Gulf War. It's happening. Um, they are moving in with s- Israeli snipers, targeting children, targeting doctors. It, it's beyond dystopian. It's it's just crazy. It's like they, they've been raiding the hospital all night saying that they're going to find this magical command center that has think- all this interconnected series of tunnels beneath. And and as we know, Israel's the one who built a bunker under the Al-Shifa hospital back when they were occupying Gaza. So, wow, what a surprise. They knew that this room was there. And it's just lie after lie after lie. And what's crazy now is now we're in this other phase of the assault where it's Israeli soldiers just committing wanton war crimes on the ground, like staging photo ops with different Palestinians saying, oh, look, we're distributing water. And then you see photos later of those same Palestinians that were in these photo ops forced to, probably with a gun to their head, killed, executed in ditches. And again, media just running with it because they're desperate. They're desperate to paint Israel as the good guy. When we know what the hell is going on on the ground, it's it's so frightening to think of what they are doing. And now my friends in Gaza say this could be the last day because the internet, the fuel, I mean, it's completely, they've expended all the fuel. Um, Israel's putting out propaganda. Oh, we're going to bring them, incub- we're going to bring the babies incubators. They have, they have incubators. They need fuel. And they are running out, and and tomorrow they could go dark again. And we know what's going to happen when there's a cover of darkness. The atrocities are going to ratchet up, and it's really unfathomable to think of what is going to be committed. And then the next day they're probably going to pose for a photo op for for propaganda of them holding up supplies with— holding up boxes with medical supplies written in giant, perfectly printed paper in English, clear enough for the cameras to see and, and carrying hospital beds wrapped in like makeshift saran wrap, calling it, oh, we're here to distribute aid to El Shifa hospital. We're not here. We're not here to occupy. It's, I, I, I saw, I saw a photo of them unloading. It took two IDF soldiers to carry a five pound metal rack wrapped in saran wrap. It, you guys are carrying these, these full, like f- the boxes look like they have been through the shits and then the perfectly printed paper stamped on top that says medical supplies and them carrying it when you can clearly see that it's, it's an empty box. It's an, like a, a weighted box does not move the same as an empty box. It's so, it's so embarrassing for them, but at the same time, embarrassing for the people who are who are eating this up and buying it and and regurgitating it and defending it that's what's that's what's really blowing my mind the amount of people who have who have come out as an open idiot in the past month that's that's what it says to me when when i see people defending this and buying into the propaganda like i i had no idea you were so mentally weak and susceptible to to tricks by the government no less like if God bless any boyfriend you've ever had. You must have been the easiest thing to manipulate. What the fuck? How I like? How do you not have more than two brain cells just holding hands and like d- keeping you afloat? I mean, it's the most low grade propaganda. Like the exactly. like how they said they found <laughs> copies of Mein Kampf, Mein Kampf <gasps> in the in like bombed out homes with like not a scratch on it. It's just like these and freshly I printed <laughs> pamphlets. <laughs> Oh my god, it's it's actually it's actually comical. Or or like the the um the the playbooks, the the playbooks that says that says Hamas's next operation 101 and inside is the details of what they were doing and that's why we bombed the hospital. Like it's it's so embarrassing to see someone stand up there and 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 say these things and oh my god, it's even it's even more embarrassing to to buy into it. I I I I feel I feel like I mean we're being gaslit. We're literally being gaslit. We're sitting here. What well, what we've said the most this entire this entire time is I feel like we're going crazy because <laughs> of gaslit. <laughs> having to defend having to defend common sense and and something that's obvious will make you feel like you're going crazy. Like wh- why how am I how am I telling you that it's not that it's not okay? to not to not push for a ceasefire when children are the ones being killed when when the the rate for getting actual the, the actual targets is 99.9% civilians to to 1% Hamas members like may, it it does not make sense and it doesn't make 
it doesn't make sense even more to see people like Hillary Clinton saying that Israel has a right to defend itself indefinitely. And then her tweets from from a couple years ago come up and she said something along the lines of Russia, it's it, Russia has no right to bomb hospitals. That is a war crime. Is it? Do you really believe that? Or do you believe that just for Russia or just for a country that that isn't lining your pockets? Make it make sense. I mean, make it make sense. Because I have never seen anything like an, an all-out war being waged, one-sided war, on hospitals. You sit back and just think, how the fuck is the world letting Israel do this? We know why. I mean, it, it's not the world. Let's correct that. It's the it's the West. And and it's really, if you want to square in on who's really perpetrating this, it's the U.S. And they're sitting back, arming Israel to the teeth. We just, we're sending, our government is sending like hellfire missiles, like hundreds more bombs. It's just like, we know where these are going to go. It, it's crazy. I mean, if Biden said stop, they would stop today. But Biden's done the opposite. He said, there's no red lines. There's no red lines. You see how Israeli officials are even crazy enough to like put out there that they're considering dropping a nuke on Gaza. It's like- Like they haven't already. They've dropped the equivalent yeah, of one, just right. not all at the same time. Right, right. And you, you know, you mentioned being gaslit. I can't even imagine you as a Lebanese woman. I mean, growing up in Lebanon, and I want to talk about this because- you know what it's like. You know what Israeli aggression looks like. You've lived through air raids from the Israeli military. You grew up in an occupied area. Um, talk about your childhood and how you were radicalized, I guess, politically, and, and your consciousness was like centered around the fact that you were in Lebanon and that Israel was uh, you know, aggressively trying to move into your country. For the longest time, I I wasn't even allowed to ever step foot in Israel and to to be a child and be and be told that you're not allowed to enter a country because of where you were born that that makes the gears start start going like what that doesn't make any sense why and then and then living through see, seeing the stress that it puts on on everyone around you and and not really fully understand obviously I have no concept of what geopolitical war and, and, and tension means as a, as a like eight year old. But I do understand what it means to see my mom cry and to see, and to see her uh, uh, grab. There was, there was one air raid that I remember very specifically, and it was when we were living in Beirut. And, um, um, I, a, a little child's arm that lived on the floor that we live on got broken and torn out of the socket because we had to run down the stairs so fast to try and find a bunker and to get out of the buildings because we had no idea where it was going to hit because they, we just knew they don't aim. They don't care what they hit. They just launch rockets and hope it hits something. And they actually are hoping that it hits civilians and causes as much damage as possible. So to be, to be, to be in to be in that room waiting for all of this to end having having a, a child that was less than 1 year old 1 years old crying because because their their shoulder has been ripped out of its socket and us not being able to do anything like that has been ingrained in in my head my entire life um having to pass through through checkpoints was something that I that I always thought was like just a part of life um there was still checkpoints up to up to like the early 2000s in the south and um you feel you feel the energy completely shift when when we come up to these things you feel the fear in people that you look to for comfort and security and reassurance and to look to someone like like a family member for that and not see it because they're scared at such at such a at such a young age will leave an impression on you and even though i had no idea why things were happening, I knew that that things were happening and they were negatively affecting us. Um, we moved to America and honestly not not much changed. 9/11 happened the year that the year that we moved here and I started to see I started to see racism almost immediately um, as like my introduction to to America. Um, it wasn't until it wasn't until 
like f- maybe five years ago that I started to to really grow and educate myself and learn to not play into those tropes or 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 have internal racism towards myself um because that's that's all I ever knew that's all I ever knew everyone in the world thinks Arabs are terrorists and that was just that was just fact to me um but also growing growing up here and see and seeing um Arabs represented more in the media and seeing that it was that it was possible to also be an Arab of of positive influence is is why I'm so vocal and why I will never back down because I I feel like I've lived through both I've lived through through what Zionism has done to the Middle East and honestly the hand that Zionism has on racism in America it's such an important point um and it's like the propaganda campaign of the those hostage posters that are putting up being put up everywhere and those Lebanese girls who were ripping them down. And, you know, it's like this big tactic now to try to, you know, deflect from like the genocide that's unfolding is like everything's about these hostages and the posters and the billboards of the hostages. And so anyone who's like taking them down is now branded as anti-Semitic or, you know, somehow this false equivalency that they're like as bad as, you know, fill in the blank. And so they're all targeted campaigns. And and those Lebanese girls who were just like, fuck Israel, fuck Netanyahu. Um, And then it turned out that they had this shared trauma. They're Lebanese. They grew up in um, under Israeli bombings. Everyone from that region has experienced this sort of aggression. They know the wide reaching impact of Israeli colonization. And it's, it's that shared trauma. And it's like, Americans have no idea the impact that Israel has had on the Middle East. And that's just one example. I'm sure like, I mean, everyone has a shared story. That's again, why like Palestinians and and strong Arabs are a threat because just by being popular, like if you talk about your history and if you're a proud Arab and you're proud of your heritage, then like that's folded into the oppression, the subjugation from the West um, and also just the aggression from the Israeli state. It's so, those girls, they were there in 2006. Their neighbor's house got bombed when they were stuck there during the 2006 war. They, I, how, how can you, how can you know that and still blame them for the way they feel about this? Like, like these hostage posters or anything other than propaganda. Like what are, what are they for other than propaganda when Israel is the one who is killing the hostages one at a time. The woman who came out and um, and reprimanded Netanyahu for the way he's handled everything and, and for what he's done to the country, the, the hostage who was sitting there with the two other women, she died a couple days ago from an indiscriminate bombing. Like how how can how can they say how can Zionists defend the hostages and make it about the hostages when they see this playing out. Like this, this isn't, they're not, they're not being like beheaded as, as an act of, of, of terrorism and, and being tortured publicly and being humiliated. They are being used as a pawn to get their hostages back. And they are being taken care of for the most part from what we've seen for that. That's, that's, as far as we know from testimonies of people who have been released or, or who, who have, who, or who we've heard from, um, how, how can you see that? And then also see that, that they're just carpet bombing the entire place when they have no idea where the hostages are. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. They do not, they do not care about the hostages. They care about the fact that they finally have the green light to do what they've wanted to do for years, which is ethnically cleanse Palestinians, push them out of Gaza and take over Gaza and do whatever, whatever they want with it. I mean, the, uh, according to, um, the influencers, the, the Zionist Israeli influencers on TikTok, they cannot wait until Gaza is flattened and then cleared. And then they build a Disneyland and a Sephora and, and, a and a smoothie shop there. And this is the reality that's in Israel. They can't wait for all of these things to happen. They, they're excited for, they, they cheer it on and, 
when you sit back and think about what it is they're they're promoting and supporting and and defending i i really i really worry about <laughs> what that's going to be viewed as in in 10 years is it going to be seen as the same sentiments that nazis had is it going to be seen the same as as we look at world war 2 yeah, and we can't forget what the U.S. position was during that. Not only did we take all the Nazis in and give them jobs, but we turned away all the Jewish refugees. I so. mean, who, who, who put Hamas in power? Who trained? Like that—that that goes back to the same thing. It was they were, they were impl- like it. None of it makes sense. None of it makes sense. How are? How am I sitting here, like spitting out? More facts than the actual government leaders of our nation. Like, how is it that I'm just a girl? I'm just a girl. What the fuck is going I'm on? I'm just how a girl. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. Well, a lot of them, like the Christian evangelicals, it's, it gets even more oh trippy God. when you see that they oh actually want like the hellfire like to come on, on Jews because – it, it's like so crazy. It's just for their apocalyptic vision. And that's when Jesus will will rise again. When all of the Jews re, uh, are re just fo- go back to Israel, and when they're all in the same spot, that's that's when um, evangelicals can finally take over. Z- Z- the biggest spreader of Zionism in the West is evangelical Christians, and not enough people realize that there is. There is no anti-Semitism rooted in anti-Zionism. You mentioned D.C. I lived there for several years. It's a very soul-sucking, bizarre place because, like, everyone's an agent. Everyone's, like, seems like a spook or an operative, and it's, like, very hard to trust people. I can't imagine growing up in my formative years there. But, man, Sarah, I— Aren't you sad that you missed the pro-genocide rally? Like, I really wanted to be a part of that rally and stand holding hands and chanting, kill more babies, murder oh children, no ceasefire. Oh, my God. No, the the chance of no ceasefire over over someone talking about protecting children is is truly enough to, like, I, people, people are having to hide their faces, hide their tattoos, hide what they look like to go out and support peace in the world at a protest versus people openly calling for a genocide and them being, although what does history show us? Were, were the police on the, on the right side of civil rights? Were the universities on the right side of civil rights? Was the government was, were any of these institutions? No, they weren't on the right side of civil rights. They weren't on the right side of world war two in the beginning. They weren't on the right side of any of these movements because it doesn't serve them. It doesn't line their pockets. It doesn't benefit them. So are we really surprised? It's, it's ap- at the end of the day, it's not as many people there anyway. That's, that's what, that's, what's so beautiful. The, the turnout for, for the, the ceasefire and the pro peace protests completely dwarfs the pro-genocide protests. I saw this joke that was like, it, it quote tweeted a photo of it, of them claiming it was 250,000 mm-hmm. people. Someone said, um, there's more people at an Arab wedding. Than this- <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's no. Yeah. I'm really devastated that I, that I missed that. Um, they let really anti-Semites don't. speak at the rally too. Who? It was some Christian uh, Zionist guy, just some some notorious like racist Christian Zionist, and then you have Deborah Messing and Van Jones. It's like what what a bizarre group of people you got up there promoting genocide, man. Well, Van Jones will promote anything that allows him uh, an open mic. I mean that that <laughs> video of him from nineteen ninety three started circulating, uh, and it's just so obvious that he's simply just an opportunistic f- fame whore. Yeah. Yeah. He'll go to the opening of a paper bag. I mean, that guy is so irrelevant. <laughs> He's so irrelevant and su- such a washed up loser. Um, oh my <laughs> it's like, how pathetic do you have to be to go and be the face of this? It's five weeks in, 4,000 children dead. Almost half of all the civilians dead are children. And how dare you, Van Jones, you sick, sick man. Disgusting. And to, and to still stand there after after hearing the no ceasefire chants from the crowd is... Oh, yeah, because and wait, I think it was actually over him being like, 
like denouncing anti-Semitism and then kind of trying to denounce like Islamophobia or being like, we should yeah. have, and people are like, yeah. no, <laughs> no, no, keep killing, killing kids. Children. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He was saying we need to stop killing children. And I think it was something as, as soft as on both sides and the, yeah. the chair erupted, no ceasefire, no ceasefire. Like what? And then look what? at Elizabeth Warren. This is, I mean, she is oh, such God. a phony. I've always strongly disliked her because of what she did. Yeah. Cherokee, Abby. Oh, Excuse what? oh me. come on. You're, <laughs> hey, she's a woman of color. <laughs> her great, 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 great grandmother was part Cherokee. I have never seen someone reach so hard to, to have, a, like, no, it's, yeah, yeah, she's, She's absolutely disgusting. I saw that video of her telling the woman who said she lost 68 family 68. members. In the 68. I'm enjoying my dinner. Um, excuse my me? is going to get cold. Uh, like, gross. I'm like, I'm eating a steak. Like, hello? Oh my God. That, that disgusted me. That was, that, that really went to show there is. I mean, it's it's like it's like that meme. the The Republicans sent bombs. The mm -hmm. Democrats sent bombs with rainbows drawn on them. Yeah, yeah. I they're mean, all, they're all opportunistic. I mean, the the amount of Democratic representatives that voted to censure um, Representative uh, Rashida, uh, Representative Rashida, they all had significant donations to their campaigns from um from an Israeli uh lobby group from thirty five thousand dollars up to up to something like a million dollars and the fact that that's even allowed is is something that should make you question everything about the way our government is set up and what's allowed and and the the things that that we are okay with and that we're voting for. Yeah, APAC is so vitriolic and all its like appendages are just, they're horrible because what they'll do is they'll fundraise and actually put out like ads that actually have nothing to do with Israel. But let's say you're a member of the squad and you dare to talk about the reality of Israeli apartheid, which all human rights organizations agree with. They'll like fundraise for your opponent and put out like crazy destructive ads about something completely unrelated. So like their hands are washed clean of like what the smear campaign is, but it's so insidious. And it's also just knowing that if you're a politician and you speak out about this, your career will be destroyed. Your reputation, your reputation will be targeted. At the same time, it's like, I don't give a shit. You're in public service to speak the truth and to hold people accountable, right? So fuck you. If you're not going to be brave enough to do that and to stand up to this crazy maniac genocidal state that we're arming. Um, but I remember, I'll never forget Elizabeth Warren's tweet just when um, the refugee camp was bombed and hundreds were massacred for, I guess, one Hamas guy they said was in the vicinity of the area. So I guess, you know, 400 people because they're all animals, according to these people. And, and Elizabeth Warren's tweet was Hamas human shields. Sh like, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, I denounce the killing of civilians, like, even though Hamas is using them as human shields, like, it still doesn't justify this. It's like, what are you talking about, Hamas human shields? What in the hell is wrong with you? How dare you? It's such dangerous rhetoric, and it's really scary because it feels like it's foreshadowing something, something, something much bigger. All of these, all of these politicians are rallying around this this verbiage and and these things that they're pushing and trying to implement into all of our minds to see to see a direct correlation between Palestinians and human shields and Hamas and human shields and all of these things it's like they're they're laying all of this groundwork so that when i mean not i, I was going to say when something big and and tragic happens like every single day hasn't surpassed the the, the previous one but it, I, it, it almost feels like, it almost feels like they're mentally preparing us to not sympathize with Palestinians if, 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 if they do drop a fucking nuclear weapon, if they do something like that, if they, if they do expel 2 million people into the Sinai desert, I, I feel like they're preparing us to not see them as human and, and making it dangerous for us to sympathize with them. I mean, these politicians are scared of, of speaking out. Everyone is scared of speaking out. 
college students are scared of speaking out. College, the Jewish voice for peace is being attacked. Organizations that are voices for peace are being attacked. Like that is absolutely insane to me. I, I, I it's, it's so scary. It's really, really scary. Um, the Florida governor is talking about deporting all Arabs from the state. He, he mentioned that a couple weeks ago and it's like, what, what the fuck do they think that, like, what do they think that means? What, where, and where will we go? Like most of the Arabs in Florida are probably also U S citizens or we're, like it's it's re, it's really scary to to hear things like this. It makes living in such a red state terrifying. Terrifying. Absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, it's so crazy to hear like what Trump is saying. Like the Democrats are so so horrible and such enablers and backers of genocide and gaslighting all of us. But there's still like this like vague humanitarian cover where it's like, oh, we need a pause in the genocide, da, 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 and, and ooh, well, you shouldn't attack hospitals, but I'm not going to do anything to stop you. And then meanwhile, you have Trump and DeSantis being like, we need to deport all Hamas sympathizers. You're like, sorry, what does that mean exactly? Um, it's terrifying. And, and they are priming us. They're priming us every day to normalize these atrocities and to normalize the demonization and dehumanization of Arab people because they know that Israel has the green light to fulfill their endgame. And like you said, they are gleeful about it. it despite having this national tragedy that's their 9-11, they seem pretty happy to be taking back um, what they had previously occupied. Um, and... You know, I want to talk really quickly because you got into a lot of heat for saying something that there is an argument to be made for, which is Hamas is not a terrorist organization. Um, that word has been rendered completely meaningless. I, I think it's really interesting because there is this pro-Israel firewall like across the corporate media. We know how the corporate media operates. We know what it does. Um, you know, we know its role basically as an appendage of the U.S. empire. But I think it's super fascinating considering how much this conflict is in the news right now, that there's no like deep dives. Like who is Hamas? Like beyond the cartoonish label that they're a terrorist organization, who really is comprised of Hamas? And also what are the political dynamics in not only Gaza, but the West Bank, because Hamas isn't in the West Bank. So this attempt to paint the caricature of all Palestinians as Hamas doesn't really make any sense when you look at the 3 million Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank. And also when you look within Gaza, there's a mosaic of different political ideologies. There's multiple armed resistance groups within that area. It's not just Hamas. Right now, there's right. this there's this term for like hundreds of kids who have survived so far that have no remaining family. Israel has also talked about that. They have mentioned that they have they've actually defended the killing of children for that reason because they've 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 said, well, because of what they've been through, they're most likely going to grow up to join Hamas. And it's like it's it's really 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 sad that that they lack any sympathy for for these children of that acronym wounded child no surviving family as just a future terrorist in their eyes the black panthers were also a terrorist organization in the eyes of the united states nelson mandela was a terrorist in the eyes of the united states all of these people who support the freedom of palestine and and the sovereignty of palestine were also branded as terrorists at one point or another. You know who's a terrorist organization? The United States of fucking America. They are seen as a tar as a terrorist organization by a handful of countries around the world because they fully fit the criteria of one. It's completely lost its meaning and been attributed to to Arabs and and seen as something only specific to Arabs because of all of the propaganda and and the the mental training that they've pushed on us in America post 9-11, it's, it's lost its meaning because now it just means, oh, an Arab. A terrorist is an Arab. It's not, it, it can't be the U.S. government. They're white. They're the good guys. They're the children of light and Arabs are the children of darkness and they must be eviscerated. Straight up Nazi rhetoric there um, to yeah. be put out by the prime minister's account 
you know, and I mean, I thought that whole like hypothetical, like, would you go back and kill baby Hitler? And everyone's like, oh man, that's so hard to, I don't know. Like, could you kill a baby? Cause it's like, why are we like, wasn't that like a big thing? Like, like, oh man, like that's so crazy to think about. Like, would you do it if you could? And it's like, well, that's literally the rationale. Like Israeli officials and media pundits are yeah. out there just saying this as if it's normal. Like, well, there's no innocent civilians in Gaza. We have to kill the children because eventually they're going to grow up to want to kill Israelis. So like, what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, of course, that's why they need, they need snipers shooting into the walls of the ho- shooting into the windows of the hospital, because as soon as those babies in the, that have been ripped out of their incubators grow up, if they grow up and find out that they were ripped out of their incubators, they're going, they, they might be a little upset. That's, that's their reasoning, I guess, for, for killing all of the children in the hospital. Unbelievable. I, I mean, it's, it's so many levels of just insanity. It's hard to even parse through at this point. I, it's like, what's next? I mean, could it get any more harrowing? than it is right now and to see our politicians just sit back and I know that they're seeing these videos like are, they're just robots I mean how how are you not deeply disturbed looking at the footage coming out of Gaza right now well, how many refugee camps and hospitals did Biden and Obama bomb like they are no different than the Republicans it's like poor see like god damn Syria definitely remembers how many bombs Biden sent they're not surprised by any of this yeah good point and and like you said i mean the rest of the world sees the US for what it is sees Israel for what it is americans are sadly among the last of the people to wake up to the true nature of our government. And that it, it's a testament to how strong the propaganda is. But again, like to remain optimistic in the light of all this horror, things are changing very rapidly. This moment is a catalyzing moment, I think, for tens of millions of people who maybe were disaffected from the letdown of Bernie. And they realize now that there needs to be a revolutionary change in this country because our political establishment is um, completely complicit. And it shows this huge growing disconnect between the ruling class and the people of this country. And something's got to give, Sarah, because the world can't wait. Gaza can't wait. Palestine can't wait. We have to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters there and do everything that we can to fight for their liberation and fight our government for upholding these barbaric policies. I completely agree. It starts it starts with us and it really starts with the working class. This guy who is who who's a union leader, they have refused to to load things onto the ships and and he's urging the rest of the working class to stand in solidarity because it starts with the working class. It's st- like it starts with the people working on the lines manufacturing these hellfire missiles and and these weapons that are being sent to kill innocent civilians and children. And people are realizing that the working class is on the right side of history. And for them to to make calls to mobilize and to put their livelihoods on the line just to take a stance is is so so inspiring and so hopeful that it it, it just goes to show like the, the the difference in who supports which side and you always got to be on the side with the working class. They have never been wrong. <laughs> and they've forced the hand of government. Power truly is with the people. And especially as we sit back and watch Biden send 2,000, 2,000 hellfire, just that word is so dystopian, hellfire yeah, they, missiles. Who comes up with these names? Like that is, it's it's really, really disgusting that they that they put these like little video video game names on these things that are so barbaric and used on a civilian population. Like that's, that, that's the part that, I mean, don't, we haven't even gotten started on, on the dropping of white phosphorus, which is, I mean, the U S is no stranger to that. How, how much agent orange did they drop in, in Vietnam and, and during all of their, all of their wars that they started for no reason. And by the way, simply left. Like they did not win Afghanistan. They did not win Vietnam. It's very easy to be surprised by our government's complicity in this. But at the same time, our government is the one that is usually doing this. So are we really surprised? Are we really surprised that they don't see people who who look like 
white European descent as, as humans, n- no, they could not care less. What they care about is the fact that wartime is great for defense contracts. It's great for the economy on the U.S. side, and it strengthens relationships with Israel. It feels like talking in circles almost, mm-hmm. and you almost start to feel like a conspiracy theorist because th- this is just these are just the facts. This is just the common sense of it all. And and to have to explain that and defend it is like, what? How, what, how are we talking about this? How how is this a conversation? It's 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 disgusting. But then you also feel naive for saying that. Like, I want world peace. Okay, that's not how the world works, unfortunately. But. You cannot. You you can't stop talking about it. You have you have to keep you have to keep fighting for it. You have to keep pushing for it, and you have to keep speaking and sharing the truth because fucking hell, the propaganda might outweigh that, and you never want that to happen. Amen. You're always welcome in Oregon if you if you're driven out of Florida by the Desantis crowd and all the crazy rabid Zionists. <laughs> Come to I'm Oregon so- and hang out with me. Uh, Sarah, it's amazing to talk to you. Uh, you have so much going on. You are a fashion icon. You ha- Do you have your own clothing line too? Like I can't keep up with all the stuff you're doing. Talk about where people my- can find you, what you're up to, and um, plug your socials. Uh, Mia Khalifa on Twitter and Instagram. And um, yeah, honestly, not not a place to to promote anything. I'm just so yeah. thankful that you gave me this opportunity to come to come and talk about this. Um, I'm I'm really grateful and I'm so happy I got to meet you and hopefully I'll meet you in person in Oregon one day. I love it. Thank you so much, Sarah. You're the best. I really appreciate your time. Uh-huh.